What is up, everyone? Welcome back to a road trip edition of Tidal Gardens. Today, we are visiting the amazing home aquarium of Andrew Sandler of Polo Reef in Old Westbury, New York. Let's go. This aquarium is possibly one of the largest private home aquariums in the world, and it is easily the nicest reef aquarium I've seen by a large margin. It's not just the immense size of the aquarium either. There are a lot of really cool technical details and some very interesting livestock choices to talk about. Andrew and his staff have done a masterful job of putting this thing together. Even now, when I'm editing this video, it is just a mind-boggling accomplishment. It's hard to even pick out a starting point on what to talk about. I'll try to organize my thoughts as best I can. I guess that the best place to start is right at the beginning when I first walked in and saw it. Like many people with an internet connection, I've seen video on this tank before. It's been featured on many channels and other publications like Coral Magazine. Let me tell you though, until you see this tank in person, it is hard to appreciate how incredibly big and nice it is. There are two things going on visually that disguise how large this aquarium is, which sounds crazy because it does not look small. But again, it is a lot bigger than what it even looks like. The first is just how optics and water work. Looking through a column of water compresses what you see. So this aquarium is 16 feet long, by 15 feet front to back and nine feet tall. You can easily appreciate the 16 by nine front facing panel, but that front to back dimension looks compressed until you look at the tank from one of the side panels and then you get the full view of just how gigantic it is. Also, this speaks to the size of the coral colonies in this tank. When you are looking through the front panel and see a decent sized coral colony against the back wall, that thing has to be monstrously large because the water optics makes things look flatter. That coral is still every bit of 15 feet away and it's still looking big. The second illusion that masks the size of this aquarium is the fish. We're used to seeing certain familiar fish such as anthias, yellow tangs, these heniocus butterfly fish, etc, etc. And having a mental touchstone on their size and scale you can kind of get this feel for the size of the tank that you see online. That does not work for this tank. The fish in this tank are absurdly large. For example, the anthias in my tank are about two inches long tops. The ones in here look like they're six to 10 inches long. I didn't even know that they grew to that size. And this is not like a square block versus a liar tail. No, they're both liar tails. One is just triple the size. The butterfly fish that I typically see at a local fish store are what, maybe three inches, four inches? They're easily 12 inches here. They are bigger than my head. So all the media that I consumed leading up to this trip, the fish make the tank seem smaller, if that makes sense. Still huge, but smaller than when you're actually sitting in front of it. No doubt it is a breathtaking display at first glance, and it actually gets more impressive the more time that you spend with it, which is absolutely bonkers. But since we are on the topic of fish, let's talk about the selection of fish in this tank. This is a collection of some of the most rare species all in a single aquarium. There are fish in this tank that are so rare, I feel like I'm talking about Bigfoot, like there were only a handful ever in captivity and their existence is almost a rumor. Nobody ever really sees one. It's a blurry photo at best. Well, they are here right in front of my face and there's not just one of them, there's like four of them. Any one of these could be the signature specimen in an extravagant reef display where it's kind of that those who know, know sort of situation. But in this tank, they're just everywhere you look. Now, I am admittedly not a fish expert by any means, but even I am aware that some of these fish are legendary finds and 
frankly, I might not see them around ever again in another home aquarium because many of them are unique hybrids. So real quick, I will just point out a few that I noticed. We have here a banded angel. This is a masked angel. This is a wrought iron butterfly fish, super, super rare. A conspiculatus angel. Tinker's butterfly. Linardi ras. This is probably the most famous fish in here, but this is an aberrant Desjardin tang. Got some crosshatch triggers, which by the way, were spawning this weekend. We have some masked butterfly fish. These are the signature Red Sea butterfly. I think they're the semi larvatus butterfly fish. And the last one that I'm going to point out is this sunrise hogfish from Hawaii, which is a deep water species. Very, very rare. I am absolutely sure that there are some insane fish in here that I'm completely ignorant of. So if you saw something crazy in this footage, let me know in the comments. Like I said, this is a really well curated collection of fish that people don't get to see very often. Another observation, guys. Many of these fish aren't reef safe at all, yet here we are. There are several large angels and butterflies that are known coral eaters, and there's even a parrot fish or two, and you know those things are eating something. Andrew mentioned that there are a few corals here and there that are a little unhappy about getting nipped at, but on the whole, it looks like the corals in this tank are doing really well. Perhaps it's a matter of like the sheer volume of coral spreads out the periodic damage from some fish. Something like that might be in the works. In my conversations with Andrew, I definitely got the sense that he is a fish enthusiast first. His coral collection is outstanding in its own right, don't get me wrong, but he can go into exacting detail about every single fish in this tank, where they're found, what temperature they like, what their habitat looks like, and all the difficulties in acquiring such rare specimens, especially once you start having to go deep. Just as an example, this wrought iron butterfly is found in Japan and in pretty cold water where there isn't a ton of coral. He was worried about having this fish in a coral heavy tank because, you know, who knows, maybe it would just single handedly destroy everything. Also, the tank is slightly warmer than what it's used to, so he had to find a midpoint temperature where it was ever so slightly chilly for a tropical reef, but on the warm end for what the wrought iron butterfly is typically found in. I think it's around 77 degrees, give or take a degree, where in the wild this fish is found in about 72, 73 degrees. These balancing act types of concessions have to be made for such a variety of fish that are a mix from all over the Pacific at different strata in the water column, things like that. On the topic of quarantine, adding another fish or another coral into this tank is a scary proposition. It only takes one fish or one coral with a bug to cause an outbreak. One could argue that it's a practical inevitability, but that is always my big worry. It's like every new addition is a grenade that you just lob into your tank. Now this tank has a 10 foot UV sterilizer with 10 bulbs in it that greatly assist in managing diseases and parasites in the water column. But when possible, you want to prevent anything from getting into the tank in the first place. To this end, there is a quarantine system that is the size of a small retail store in the basement. It is made up of four 500 gallon tanks. On the fish side, it is mostly empty. There are some blue green chromas there, and there are these little purple yellow tang hybrids that were captively bred, quite the find. I wanted to do a video all about quarantine methods one day, but honestly, the topic itself is a sprawling mess. Certain fish can't tolerate certain medications, and what starts off as a straightforward primer quickly spiders out into a species-by-species -species logic tree. It can be a really overwhelming topic to dive into, but I assure you that even in a modest home aquarium, setting aside a small tank or two for quarantining new arrivals can be a lifesaver to an established tank. On the coral side, he's got a small collection building up. I'm not sure if these are going to end up in their big display or in another tank down the road, but he's got a little collection of some anemones, some large polyp stonies, things of that sort. 
let's take a look what's behind the curtain of what makes this tank run. This is my wheelhouse right here. I love me some infrastructure design. To filter this water, there are a number of technologies at work. We can start with some of the basic stuff and then get into the more esoteric items that are uncommon on small aquariums, but become kind of necessary on large aquariums. First up, there are two massive protein skimmers made by MRC. These things are roughly three feet in diameter and 10 feet tall. One of them is being fed ozone. And Andrew said that he could tell when ozone is being delivered because that skimmer would outperform the other one. That is interesting because you don't often get to see a side-by-side -side comparison like that. Usually, ozone observations like this when it comes to skimmers is based on a single skimmer's production with the ozone on or off. Because of that, I've kind of heard it both ways where ozone either enhances skimming or that it doesn't make much of a difference. But in this build where you have two massive skimmers side by side, you can clearly see the effect of ozone in one versus the other. So again, I found that pretty interesting. Speaking of ozone, there is this unit made by Clearwater on the wall that is delivering the ozone. Lots of it. Now, it may or may not be working quite right because the dehumidifier in this room went down and the humidity plus ozone generator, that's not a great mix. You want your air as dry as humanly possible. What happens in a humid environment is that the corona discharge in the ozone generator sparks up and it reacts with nitrogen that's in the air. It forms like this scum-like deposit that decreases the efficiency of the unit over time. You can clean the unit out more often to compensate for this, but the root cause is that humidity and it's gonna be this recurring issue. Given that this ozone generator is sitting close to what amounts to a giant swimming pool, there is a good chance that it needs a good cleaning after this dehumidifier gets repaired. The other way that you can tell the ozone might not be functioning at 100% is that the water is not freakishly clear. This tank is by no means murky. Just being able to see the end of a 16 foot deep tank is amazing clarity in its own right. But when ozone is working at peak capacity, it almost makes a tank look fake, like it's rendered. Obviously, you can check your ORP numbers and see if those ORP figures are dipping. ORP, we'll get into a little bit later, is oxidative reductive potential. And it's a rough estimate of water cleanliness. But like I said, we'll touch on that a bit later. Around the corner, there is an activated carbon reactor as well as a GFO reactor. I don't have to go into too much detail on this. Most of you are probably familiar with what these chemical medias do. Activated carbon binds up all sorts of pollutants in the water, while granular ferric oxide, GFO, is used to lower phosphate. Moving on, we have a mechanical filter. This is a sand filter, and it is filled with tiny glass beads. On a system of this size, the water returning to the sump is so aggressive that you can't really do much of anything with filter socks. They immediately just get blown away. And when we start to talk about return pumps and that sort of thing later, you'll see why the, it's very turbulent. So there is a sand filter that accumulates detritus and then it periodically blows itself out and self cleans. I think that these filters come from the pool industry. When I saw this, I really, like the idea of a mechanical filter that automatically cleans itself in this fashion. It might be a super pain right now for me to implement, but perhaps in a future thing, this is something worth considering on a really big system. Next up, Sulfur Reactor. This, guys, is something that I have not seen in a really long time. The purpose of this filter is to remove nitrate from the system. This being a reef tank that has hundreds of giant fish that gets fed over five pounds of food per day, just having live rock and a little live sand, calling it a day, that's not gonna cut it. This system runs at nitrate levels hovering around five to 15 parts per million, in large part due to this device. How it works is water from the system gets sent slowly through this main chamber, which is filled with a sulfur media. The slow flow of water creates an anaerobic environment that allows, well, anaerobic bacteria to grow on that media. Real quick, aerobic bacteria is what breaks down toxic ammonia and nitrite to a much less toxic nitrate. 
fish can tolerate nitrate. Corals, on the other hand, don't appreciate high nitrate at all. So you need anaerobic bacteria in low oxygen areas to handle it. That anaerobic bacteria consumes nitrate and creates nitrogen gas, which is inert. This sulfur reactor has unintended consequences that you have to deal with. The first one is pH. The pH dives down super low inside a sulfur reactor. So before that super low pH water gets back into the system, you want to run it through a calcium carbonate stage to buffer it back up to something relatively close to the tank's pH. The second thing is, this reactor will also tank your ORP. As I mentioned before, ORP stands for Oxidative Reductive Potential. It is that rough measure of water cleanliness in a single number. If you feed your tank, that number goes down. If you do a water change, it will go up. You get the idea. In a typical aquarium, it will be around 275, 300 or so. In an aquarium that's running ozone, a good ORP is something in the neighborhood of 300 to 400. All ballpark numbers, but the higher the number means that it is a good oxidizing agent. Inside this reactor, the ORP is negative 250, meaning that it is now a strong reducing agent, and that is going to have the effect of pulling the whole tank's ORP down. Not the end of the world, but it has to be accounted for with regular maintenance, and certainly ozone injection helps. Okay, I lied there. There's three issues. The last thing I will mention about this reactor is that it is a bacteria culture, so sometimes it might work a little bit more aggressively at times, and it's possible for it to work too well and effectively reduce the nitrate too much. In that situation, the tank has to get direct addition of nitrate so that it doesn't bottom out and anger the corals. While corals don't like high nitrate, they do require a little bit, and bottoming out the nitrate levels to zero is arguably worse than having too much in the water. Since we're kind of transitioning our talk away from filtration and into the topic of water chemistry, let's cover what all goes into maintaining the desired levels. Real quick, the target levels for this aquarium for the major stuff, calcium is around 440 to 480 parts per million. Alkalinity is 8.5 to 9 dKH. Magnesium sits at around 1350 parts per million and he's shooting for a pH of around 8.1 to 8.3. These figures are tested multiple times per week, and each week an ICP is sent out. More on that later. So how does this tank maintain those levels? Starting first with the salt. This tank runs off of the ESV brand salt. This brand of salt can be bought in a multi-part system where you supply your own sodium chloride and the salt manufacturer, in this case ESV, supplies the rest in separately packaged components. This is in contrast to most of the salt industry that is a single bag or a single bucket. While it is more convenient just to have a single bag of salt that has everything in it already, there are some advantages to having everything separate and then mixing it together in stages. The biggest benefit is that some of these components want to react with one another. So, some of the formulation and additives in single bag, quote unquote, salt mixes, is just to prevent the salt from reacting with itself and degrading the quality. It's also a possible reason why some salts leave a residue when you mix it. There is also an economic benefit to doing the multi-part salt method, especially when you're talking about huge quantities of salt. Transporting a lot of salt across the country is expensive, so you can offset that expense by purchasing a high quality sodium chloride locally, which is in reality most of the weight of that salt mix. And then you ship in those separate components, which is, by weight, fairly minimal. On that front, Andrew is extra lucky because ESV happens to be a local company in its own right in New York. He is now working with ESV to make a custom blend that is higher in some things, lower in others, to better match his husbandry methodology. Okay, that is the story about the salt. Moving on. To maintain the major ions for stony coral growth in this system, he's using a combination of calcwasser dosing 
two-part dosing, and a calcium reactor. The two-part is ESV's Bionic, and he is using about 5 to 10 gallons every month. He is dosing about 40 gallons of Calcwasser each day. Most hobby-grade dosing pumps going full blast can only do about 20 gallons per day. So he needed to go up to a commercial peristaltic pump made by a German company called Stenner to get the reliability and flow rates needed to do this job. You don't hear a lot about these pumps in the aquarium industry, but they are the industry standard in commercial water treatment. I've got one in my building that doses chlorine bleach, so they are built to handle some pretty harsh stuff. The calcium reactor for this tank is an absolute monster. I can't even imagine trying to maintain something like this. Here at Tidal Gardens, we have these 12 inch units and nobody at my place wants to do that servicing. And the one that's here at Polo Reef is way bigger, maybe what 24 inches in diameter by 48 inches tall. I can imagine cleaning out the media in this thing being literally an all day activity. What is even crazier is that it might not be doing a whole lot for this tank right now. Remember that sulfur reactor that I talked about earlier? It has a second chamber full of calcium carbonate media to raise that super low pH coming out of that first sulfur chamber. Let's see, a chamber full of calcium carbonate at low pH. Does that sound sort of familiar? It should, that is exactly how a calcium reactor works. You pump in carbon dioxide to make the water inside of a calcium reactor more acidic to melt down this media and you slowly deliver it back to your tank. This is what is already happening in the sulfur reactor. As the water from the sulfur reactor gets buffered back up, it is melting down that media in that second stage, acting like a de facto calcium reactor. So maybe I misspoke when I said that this one might not be doing a whole lot. Maybe on this system, there are essentially two operating calcium reactors. As for trace elements on this tank, Andrew is dosing a bunch of individual elements based on what the weekly ICP is showing. At one point, there were so many ICP tests getting sent out that it made some financial sense to just buy a machine. But unfortunately, an ICP is not a casual piece of hardware that you just plug in and use. It takes like dedicated lab space. It takes a very skilled technician or else your results are just going to be garbage. Finding good technicians for ICP is a real challenge. I know that the pharma industry, for example, pays very well for this type of talent. It is not easy to come by. So Andrew has one sitting in his garage right now doing absolutely nothing. Anyhow, back to trace elements. Once the lab data comes back, Andrew makes out a dosing plan for a laundry list of them. And currently he is going with the reef moonshiner method. I am admittedly out of the loop on this one, but Andrew loves it. He has a stash of containers with pretty much this cornucopia of different elements to dose. And it was interesting to see that daily spreadsheet because some of the figures that I saw were all the way down to like seven mLs. So think about that for just a second. In a 17,000 gallon aquarium, seven mLs. That is some next level chemistry tweaking. Okay, moving on from water chemistry, Let's talk about heating, cooling, and dehumidification. In short, there aren't that many ways to do this in a climate like New York. In the summer, it is cooking hot, and in the winter, it is freezing cold. You just gotta brute force these things to have the capacity to get the job done. And while you're at it, you may as well buy two for redundancy. We live in a post-COVID world, and supplies may or may not be available when your dehumidifiers go down, right? The heating is accomplished by two 600,000 BTU boilers. I have a similar setup in my building with two smaller units. I think that they're about 200,000 BTU. And that's why I'm so familiar with this, you guys. <laughs> Each one can handle the entire heating load, probably, I'm just gonna guess here. But it is a smart system that trades the loads back and forth and if ever either one goes down for servicing, the other one can handle the entire project. 
This furnace room was kind of interesting because it was uncomfortably hot to stand in, which ironically is a nice place to hang the wetsuits for drying. Dual purpose, right? Did I mention that to do maintenance in this tank, you have to actually dive in it? All these corals that you see are hand planted one at a time. It's nuts, but I digress. As for cooling, there are four chiller units totaling 20 tons of cooling power. Both the heating and cooling system tie into these heat exchangers. Inside of each of these is a titanium coil that distributes the heat. As for dehumidification, again, it's brute force. You throw tons of dehumidification at the problem until the air dries out, basically. For this tank, there are six industrial dehumidifiers and they basically look like giant rooftop air conditioners and require a special coating on their coils to stave off corrosion from things like pools and salt water, stuff like that, right? Personal anecdote, these things are hilariously expensive because if you get a dehumidifier without the coating, it is like X dollars. But if you want one with the coating, they know you're screwed. You have like some weird application with some like chlorinated pool or you're right by the ocean or something like that. So that price triples. <laughs> I know, because I got the quotes for mine. It's no fun. It's no fun at all. And there are six of these things for this aquarium. Okay, moving on. Let's go. Let's talk about how water moves in a tank like this. In my opinion, I think that the water flow in this tank might be the next big time challenge for Andrew and his team. Right now, it is a mix of a number of different pumps, closed loops, power heads, return oscillators, and motorized ball valves to create both a powerful yet random flow. Because again, you don't want any dead spots, but the types of pumps you're using are so powerful, you don't want to just blast the flesh off of all your corals. It is as much of an art as it is a science. Let's start at the sump area where the return pumps are located. Up to this point, I've seen the location of the skimmers, the lab, reactor station, quarantine area, but then there's this staircase that goes down. It goes way down. We were already in the basement of this house, but there is another basement that is no joke 20 something feet down below that. And down there, it is like the bowels of the Titanic. I can't describe it any better than that. It's like being in the engine room of a ship. Down there, you can see some of the water containers for fresh and salt water. And the sump is deceptively large because I think that he said it goes 16 feet deeper into the ground. There is just so many mind boggling aspects of this build. But I remember Andrew saying that at its deepest point in this excavation was something like 40 feet below grade. I just have a hard time imagining how to go about pre-planning this eight years ago. It's wild. Anyway, from the sump, there are these 10 horsepower pumps that sit easily 10 feet above the water line in the sump. They are able to suck the water up to that height and then deliver it to the tank up on the floor above at pressure. Yeah, these pumps, kind of no joke. They deliver 45,000 gallons per hour each. They have to be cleaned monthly and then rebuilt yearly. I can see some of the out of service ones kind of laying around. And actually, there are backups to all the devices that we're talking about. So when I mentioned the whole, why not buy two for twice the price? That's what I'm talking about. There really is two of everything. Back to flow though. Here is where the flow gets a little fancy. Unlike most setups that just deliver the water back to the tank, this return system uses a number of motorized ball valves to direct the flow to different areas at different times to create a randomized motion. And that in itself is amazing to me because the return line that comes up is a 10 inch schedule 80. So on top of the 10 inch schedule 80, you need to find 10 inch motorized ball valves. On top of that, there is a separate 10 horsepower pump on a closed loop as well as a single panta ray powerhead right in the back that makes a pulsing motion. And that panta ray powerhead 
is the size of a small dog and it's powerful enough to push divers around who are trying to do maintenance. So they actually have to turn that thing off for all the divers to do their work. So with all this tech, why do I think that this is going to be the next big challenge? Ideal flow in this aquarium is always going to be a moving target. As these corals grow, it closes up the rockscape and over time, flow has to be rerouted or added to make sure that there's no dead spots. The next phase of the water circulation to provide more and more randomized flow might be the most insane bit of engineering ever. I am very excited to see what they come up with. I heard just a few of the ideas that they were tossing around and take my word for it, all of them, if nothing else, were extremely ambitious. I'll leave it at that. Gosh, we've made it this far into the video and we're just now talking about lighting. <laughs> the lighting for this aquarium is similar to what you would find at a public aquarium. You need professional slash industrial fixtures that are built to handle humid environments and then beam light down to the bottom of very deep aquariums. The fixtures are a mix of 1000 watt and 500 watt max spec LEDs. There are, I believe, 13 fixtures in total and they provide par numbers of about 450 at the top to roughly 200 at the bottom. There are some lower light areas in off axis parts of the tank, but that gives you a general idea of the intensities that are going on here. Yeah, 200 at the bottom. So such is life when you are growing Acropora seven feet down from the water surface. The lighting profile is a custom program leaning heavily into the blue light spectrum, and it only runs about two to three hours of daylight spectrum during that photo period. It might be in part due to how much more PAR is sent into the tank if more of the white LEDs are turned on without decreasing the intensity of the blue LEDs. You could play that balancing game, but I think that Andrew likes that blue aesthetic anyway, and so perhaps just to make the programming simpler, they're just running a short period of daylight. If you couldn't tell already, I'm astonished by the amount of tech and design work that has gone into this build. The years of planning, the miles of Schedule 8 plumbing and wiring, the excavation that was necessary. They had to close down roads and bridges and stuff like that to bring everything to the site. It really is an engineering marvel. But with so many devices and systems in place, how is all of this technology coordinated? Short answer, industrial control systems. Think like an automated factory or a fully fledged wastewater treatment plant. Lots of real deal industrial controls, lots of custom programming to make sure that everything works the way that it's supposed to, and monitoring, 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 lots of monitoring. He's using multiple redundant probes. And these are industrial probes, not the quote unquote laboratory grade probes that are about $100 for aquarium use. These probes are for applications that really matter. Typically, if an aquarium is reading the wrong figure, not a big deal. If a wastewater treatment plant is reading the wrong numbers, well, the EPA might have something to say about that. So these things gotta work. They are a whole lot more money, but they tend to stay much more consistent. And there are multiples to make sure that they all have to agree on what the numbers are. As an aside, one of my friends from business school owns a company that does exactly this kind of work and after seeing this implemented on a reef aquarium i'm now kind of tempted to give him a call and dig a little bit more deeply into this type of serious business control system it's like when playtime is over and stuff really has to work this is a type of control system you go with Okay guys, this video is getting a little long and frankly, I could talk for hours about it, so I'm going to call it right here. I hope that with this video, you got a glimpse of what I saw during my weekend visit. Needless to say, I thought it was pretty cool. Special thanks of course goes out to Andrew and the whole crew over at Polo Reef, especially Rashid, for being such a gracious host for our entire stay in New York. If you'd like to follow along with the progress of this aquarium, I encourage you to subscribe to Polar Reef's YouTube channel. And if you enjoy this type of deep dive content, I invite you to subscribe to this channel as well. Until next time, you guys, happy reefing.